This video will cover Chapter 3, Section 3 of your Operating Systems book. Section 3 covers Process Description. In this video, we'll cover Memory Tables, Input-Output Tables, File Tables, Process Tables, Process Control Structures, Process Identification, Process State and Control, and talk more about the Process Control block. Now, since the OS needs to manage processes and resources, it has to have information about the current status of each process and resource. A universal approach to providing this information is pretty straightforward. The operating system constructs and maintains tables of information about each entity that it's managing. The general idea of this can be shown in the figure here, which shows four different types of tables maintained by the operating system, the memory, I.O., file, and process tables. Although the details are going to be different from one OS to the other, fundamentally, every OS maintains information in these four categories. So, let's take these categories one by one. First, we'll talk about memory tables. These are used to keep track of both the main, which the real memory, and secondary or virtual memory. Processes are maintained on secondary memory using some sort of virtual memory or a simple swapping mechanism. Now, it's important to understand that there are certain things that memory tables must include in order to be effective. The allocation of main memory to processes, the allocation of secondary memory to processes, protection attributes of blocks of main or virtual memory, and the information needed to manage virtual memory. I.O. tables are used by the OS to manage the I.O. devices and channels of the system. At any given time, an I.O. device may be available or assigned to a particular process. If an input-output operation is in progress, the operating system needs to know the status of the I.O. operation and the location in main memory being used as the source or destination of the transfer. File tables provide information about the existence of files, their location and secondary memory, current status, and other attributes. Now, much or all of this information may be maintained and used by a file management system. In that case, the operating system has little or no knowledge of files, and in other cases, the operating system itself takes care of file management when there's not a file management system in place. Now, our fourth type of table is the process table. This has to be maintained to manage processes, and there has to be some reference to memory, input, output, and files directly or indirectly. Now, these tables are distinct, but it should be clear that the tables must be linked or cross-referenced in some fashion. Memory, I.O., and files are managed on behalf of processes, so there has to be some reference to these resources, directly or indirectly, in the process tables. The files referred to in the file tables are accessible via uh, an input-output device and will, at some times, be in main or virtual memory. The tables themselves have to be accessible by the operating system, and are therefore subject to memory management. Now, another consideration is how does the operating system know to create the tables in the first place? The OS has to have some knowledge of the basic environment, such as how much main memory exists, what are the I.O. devices, and what are their identifiers, and so on and so forth. This is an issue of configuration. So when the OS is initialized, it has to have access to some configuration data that define the basic environment. And these data have to be created outside the OS with human assistance or by some sort of auto configuration software. So let's talk a little bit about process control structures. First, as to location, a process has to include a program or a set of programs to be executed. And it will need to consist of at least sufficient memory to hold those programs and the data of those programs. It will also typically include a stack that's used to keep track of procedure calls and parameter passing between those procedures. Now, a process also has associated with it a number of attributes that are used by the operating system for process control. The collection of program data, stack, and attributes is referred to as the process image. Process image location will depend on the memory management scheme being used. Table 3.4 in your book has a breakdown of typical elements of a process image. Now, a very important part of the way an operating system handles processes is process identification. In most operating systems, each process is assigned a unique numeric identifier. There must be a mapping that allows the OS to locate the appropriate tables based on the process identifier. Many of the tables controlled by the operating system use process identifiers to cross-reference process tables. Memory tables can be organized to provide a map of the main memory with an indication of which process is assigned to each region. Uh, this works the same way with input, output, and file tables. Process identification is also very important when processes need to communicate with each other or when one process needs to spawn a child process. 
When they communicate with each other, the process identifier informs the operating system of the destination of a particular communication. And when processes are allowed to create other processes, child processes, identifiers indicate the parent and descendants of each process. Also keep in mind that in addition to these process identifiers we've just talked about, a process may be assigned a user identifier that indicates the user responsible for the job. Processor state information consists of the contents of processor registers. While the process is running, the information is in the registers themselves. When it's interrupted though, all of this register information has to be saved so that it can be restored when the process resumes execution. The nature and number of registers involved depends on the design of the processor. Typically, the register set will include user visible registers, control and status registers, and stack pointers. It's important to note that all processor designs include a register or set of registers, often known as the program status word, that contains status information. The PSW typically contains condition codes plus other status information. A good example of this is the eFlags register, which is used by any operating system running on an x86 processor. Yeah, again, you can refer to your book for an example of how the eFlags register is laid out and what kind of information it contains. Process control information simply indicates additional information needed by the operating system to control and coordinate various active processes. You can take a look at what kinds of information this includes in Table 3.5 in your book. This figure shows how processes are arranged in virtual memory. Each process has a process control block, including all the information we just talked about, a user stack, a private user address space for the programs and data, and any address space that's shared with other processes. It's important to note that although the figure would seem to suggest that the process images exist as contiguous blocks of memory, that's not necessarily the case. That will depend on the memory management scheme in place and the way in which control structures are organized by the operating system. Now, since process control blocks may contain structuring information, including pointers that allow the linking of the blocks to other blocks, we could set up something along the lines of a linked list to control the queues in our five state process diagram. For example, in this figure, we see process control blocks set up in linked lists in the running, ready, and blocked states. Finally, let's talk about the role of the process control block. We've covered some of this information in previous videos, but let's go over it again because it is very, very important. In fact, it's arguably the most important data structure in an operating system. It contains all the information about a process that's needed by the operating system. Blocks are read and or modified by virtually every module in the operating system, and they define the state of the operating system. So our potential problem lies not in accessing process control blocks, but protecting them. A bug in a single routine could damage process control blocks, which could destroy the system's ability to manage the affected processes, and a design change in the structure or semantics of the PCB could affect a number of modules in the OS. All of that being the case, it's very important that we have a good understanding of the process control block, what it does, and how it does it. Well, we've made it through another video. Our next will be the last of Chapter 3, and we'll be talking about process control.